In terms of producing though, David, you make it seem easy, but it's not because there's this failures over there, there's failures over there, you know, there's live end, there's, there's been a lot of failures that have gone down. So here's the young man or woman who wants to produce in Halifax and they're listening to David on, on the site. There's a challenge to it. What, I'll what, accept that. <laughs> what, are, what are the parameters? How um, do you not step off the cliff and end up uh, a failure? Well, I, you know, when my father started, he said, you know, I don't want to start too big. I want to try something small and see how it works and figure it out. I think the best training ground in the theater is the fringe. If you produce a show in the fringe, you've got all the problems pretty much of producing a show in the Royal Alex. You've got to get the actors together, you've got to get the venue, you've got to make sure people are aware of your show. And your show has to be pretty good to get seen amongst the other 125 shows in the fringe. And if you do it, that you end up filling the largest percentage of the number of seats in your venue, or in, 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 in we, uh, there's actually a prize that you can get now in the fringe as a producer, that if you fill the highest percentage that your house will accept. So if you produce 99% and you're the most successful show in the fringe for filling the most seats, you get the Ed Mervish Young Entrepreneurs Award and you walk away with 2,500 bucks. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, that's a good training ground. That's a good place to start. There are things that you can do to learn about it. I mean, we, we have line producers here uh, Linda and Tasky produces a number of shows. My daughter produced uh, um, uh, Calendar Girls in this last season. Uh, you know, so we're trying to create another generation within the family right. who actually is right. capable and interested. But in the end, you know, we'll have my t my job, and my job is just to have everybody else make me look good. It's so. the business. It's your the marriage in you of your business sense and your artistic passion and vision and that's the uniqueness and I you know uh, I failed myself with a theater company Shakespeare Works and we we had the artistic part and we didn't have the business part we thought we did yes but we came apart and I can't tell you how many small companies I see that come apart because they don't have that practicality of of how does the money work and if it doesn't work then the other part doesn't work. Robert Lepage talking to him one of the first mm. things he said is I couldn't survive artistically in a creative environment where the business forced me into decisions as a creator that I didn't want to take. Yes. So he created his own business framework as it were in which he's freer to create. So how, and how Quebec, does he... And Quebec recognizes and nourishes these things in a way we sometimes don't. You know, there are <coughs> people talk about subsidies. We subsidize oil companies in their drilling and their exploring. We subsidize all sorts of things. Uh, they don't realize somehow, you know, that we live in an engineered society. We don't live in a society that doesn't have taxes. So it's a question of how much taxes we have and what we do with them. Uh, of, of balancing resources and choosing what's of value to us in a society. Uh, French Canada sees their society as one that n needs to protect itself linguistically and therefore they see themselves as a cultural island that if they don't support it mm -hmm. they'll lose their self-identity. We never seem to feel like we need an identity in English Canada. We feel secure. So with security comes a lack of sense of self somehow in one way and a greater sense of self in another because we do feel free to compete with the world. Uh, but you look at Germany and the way they subsidize the arts, that's because they're sitting next to France and they're sitting next to Hungary and they're sitting next to Italy and they want to preserve their language group. And that's an identity question. So they have many opera houses, many, and they sing their operas in German, not Italian. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to see our circumstance and see the good things in it. You know, the good things are that we're not interfered with very much. You know, the government doesn't take a role in our lives. Uh, we can we can have theater without you know too much interference, whether it's not for profit or for profit. 
And the business sense of things is just an experience of life. Some people go to business school and they get better at it, but if they go to business school, they want to usually be more rewarded than the theater will give you. This is a low reward profession for the most part, except, you know, except for the movies and maybe te some television. Most people who work in the theater uh, do it because they actually find that they like it you know, the, and, and they made a choice about their lives. It's interesting to see Hugh Jackman come back here and do two weeks. Uh, his agents must hate him. They get 10% of the theater, 10%. He, that means he's not making a movie for $20 million. He has four movies waiting. And he told them, no, no, I'm going to go do some theater work. I like, I like being on stage. <laughs> it's, uh, so what's, all we have to do is be the lucky city. Do I go to Chicago or do I go to Toronto? Or maybe I'd like to be in Boston or, well, I could do New York. But yeah. So all the New Yorkers came here to see him and they're all trying to lure him to New York. But that's not really what he wants. He just wants to do some theater when he wants to do it. You know, and he'll do it again when he wants. He's doing movie now. But he decided he wanted to, he did San Francisco and he did Toronto. And maybe he'll do Chicago next time he feels like doing two or three weeks. What's it like as a Canadian producer being beside America, which is an enormous producing entity for entertainment theater, Britain, Europe, Germany, and we're counted at whatever, 33 million people. You seem to have a, a unique place in that producing, co-producing communities that you seem to... Well, we certainly watch everybody and we're friends with all those people in all those places who do theater on a regular basis. But the theater is what it is, which is full of surprises. Somebody will pop up with the most creative show that you didn't expect at the most unexpected time that suddenly is the show that everyone wants and nobody knows the person who did it. And you're having a brand new discussion and you hope you've left a trail of people who are happy who will stand up and speak for you. So when my father offered to buy the old Vic, they opened the envelope and they said, who is this storekeeper? This is a sealed bid for the old Vic. Sealed you? bids for the old Vic. They only had three. Cameron McIntosh? No, no, they had one that was improperly filled in. They had one from Trevor Nunn and Andrew Lloyd Webber together, and they had one from my father. And my father's was a little more money. And because it was a charitable trust, they had to take the, more ex the larger bid. Wow. And so Cameron, uh, not Cameron, but uh, we bought the theater, and then Andrew sat down with us and talked to us. And he said, look, I want to have a school to train people in England uh, in musical theater and you've gotten in the way of that. And would you please sell me the theater? And my father said, I didn't really buy it to flip it and make a profit. I bought it because Peter O'Toole and Sir John Gilgood and all these other actors have been in my theater over many years and they've told me of their days in the old Vic doing it as a dramatic theater. And I'd like a chance to do that. And if I fail, I'll sell it again and it'll be available. And so my father went on to have the theater for 15 to 17 years. Was that a face-to-face -face meeting or a phone call? No, it was a face-to-face. -face. I was present. Uh, and, you know, Andrew had a very good idea and something he wanted to do and I respect him for it. I have, you know, enormous admiration for his accomplishments. I work with him. Uh, but it was just our turn and our time and our, our opportunity. And we learned a lot from it. We had a good time. and. It was an interesting experience exiting because we were able to uh, sell on, on favorable terms the annex to the National, who continue to use it today and who improved the building enormously. Uh, we were uh, given a special Olivier Award by the Society of West End Theatres for Service to British Theatre. But the best thing that happened was I had breakfast with Stephen Daldry and he turned to me and he said, you know, we know what you did with Jonathan Miller in changing the way we look visually at sets on stage in the West End. And you had an effect on how we decided to design. So that was the best reward.